Welcome to the Thick and Mystic Moment, the show that's all about uncovering the secrets of personal transformation and celebrating the incredible stories of those who've dared to change their lives. I'm your guide, Robert John Hadfield, and together we'll explore the power of change. Let's get started. In 2006, a photograph was sold at an auction, a photograph that was called The Pond Moonlight. And it was a photograph taken in 1904, and it was sold for $2.9 million. And at the time, it was the highest uh, price anybody had ever paid at an auction for a photograph. In the year 2022, a photograph that was taken by the same guy in 1904, this photograph called the Flatiron, similar style as the other one, was sold in an auction for $11.8 million. Both of these photographs were taken by a man by the name of Edward Steichen. And he is considered by many to be the, perhaps the greatest and maybe the most important, if nothing else, photographer that ever ever lived, most influential I, whenever I hear stories like this, I can't help but think about some of my earliest photography. Uh, I, I, I do do quite a bit of photography myself these days, and some of it's pretty good. But I remember my first photos, we had a, if you remember one of those little flat cameras, and they were, they were kind of these flat kind of rectangles you'd you'd load the film as I recall into the back and then close it and then you'd turn this little dial and you'd look through it and snap and then you'd turn the dial snap just this little flat thing I remember the first time I ever used one of these things on my own my my mom got me uh, got me a camera ready to go for me to take on a school field trip I think we were going to the zoo as I recall and (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we, of course, you'd come home with those photos, then you'd have to go develop them. I remember being pretty excited about all these photos that I'd taken at the zoo. And when we got the photos back, I think there was, there was one photograph of an animal and 13 photographs of my eyeball. <laughs> so anyway, those were my... When I, he- when I hear of these, uh, these amazing photographs, and these incredible photographers, <laughs> I can't help but think back to some of those early photos that I took. Well, anyway, uh, in this, this person I'm talking about, Edward Steichen, was, it goes way back. He was born in 1879. And he was, early on in his life, was a, recognized as a, as an artist. I mean, people were able to see his talent early on because he was painting and drawing and, and having some, uh, having some success with this. And at the age of 15, he left school and he started a four year apprenticeship it, with lithography. And then in 1895, he had photography was still kind of in its infancy way back then and he'd had his eye on this camera and bought himself a little secondhand Kodak camera and supposedly speaking of first photographs his first photograph was of his cat and he kind of kept doing photography on the side but his focus was primarily painting and in in 1900, he left Milwaukee to head toward Paris, where he was going to really go study painting. And on his way to Paris, he met a man by Alfred St- uh, Stieglitz, who was probably the most popular, one of the most popular photographers at the time. And he had this really important thing happen. When he meets this guy, this guy, of course, is really impressed with his paintings, but he's also impressed with Edward's photos, and he buys three of Edward's photos from him. 
Now, this has a pretty significant impact on him because Edward sees himself primarily as a painter. And when he's taking photos, he's thinking of them in terms of painting. And and so he would... Uh, th- th- he, this this event where this guy actually bought some photos for him kind of would change his attitude a little bit about his photography and recognize the significance of that from a, from an artistic standpoint. So by the time he gets to Paris, I, I love all this stuff, what started happening to him because these are the kind of things that we talk about in here every single day, these, these big changes. Because by the time he gets to Paris and he begins studying more and more his painting, he also recognizes now the significance and the importance of his photography. And it isn't long before he sees his painting as, for all intents and purposes, high-grade wallpaper. And he thinks that he needs to just give up painting and focus on his photography. And so he tells his story where he and the gardener at the place where he was took all of his paintings, all the things that he hadn't sold yet, and they took it out in the yard and they made a bonfire and burned them all and danced around it. <laughs> As a, and he says that this was a gift to himself, a gift to himself of giving up something that, and, and, and starting something new. And beginning to focus on something that that he truly, truly loved, which was his, which was his photography. So he comes back to the United States and he starts focusing on this. And this is where these photos that I'm talking about that ended up getting sold on in this auction for you know millions of dollars. Now think about this: these photos were taken back in the in 1904. And here we were in 2006 and in 2000, what was it, 2022, where these photos are being sold for millions of dollars. So th- th- he was creating, he, he, he was really probably responsible, maybe more than anybody else, for bringing photography into the world, it, it, helping the world see it as an art form. And then it's, it's it, he still resonates to this day, this Edward Steichen. Well, anyway, so in World War I, he's hired by the United States government to go photograph, uh, do air, I think it was aerial photography. And this is another one of those things that started changing him because even though he's, he's an, shooting photographs from an art standpoint, he starts seeing things even differently because he's shooting things for the military. And this would go on and have a massive impact on not only on him, but on the world. And I'll explain here in, in a moment. But the, he, he comes back and it actually starts impacting more and more how he's taking photos. And it isn't long, by 1923, he is the primary photographer for Vogue and Vanity Fair magazines. And when you go back and look at the photos that he was taking, they still look relevant. When you see the, the things that he was doing from a light standpoint and from uh, the way he would pose people, the way he would do things, he would, he would create these, this artwork through, through his photography. And probably the most important thing, I don't know if it was the most important for him, but he, he, when you listen to interviews, he talks about this particular thing because it, it seemed to maybe encapsulate what he was all about. So he was one of these people that everybody who's anybody had their photograph taken by Edward Steichen. He was kind of a big deal, and especially because he was taking all the photos. He was the primary photographer for Vogue and Vanity Fair. He talks about this one experience where... Greta Garbo was on set. She was one of the most famous actresses at the time, back in the 1920s. Everybody knew who she was. And he had been, he was going to come take some photos of her. And she came off of set and they said, you have five minutes to get some photos. And so what they did is they set a chair up and they threw a little, you know, a black cloth over the chair and they flipped it around. And so then she kind of sat with the back of the chair in front of her and kind of put her arms up on the chair. And then she started posing. 
and it, it, she's just kind of doing her normal poses, looking this way, looking that way. And, and, and he looks at her and he says, it's too bad that we have to sit and just take pictures of you in your normal Hollywood style with your Hollywood looking hair and, you know, just all the standard stuff. And, and at that moment, Greta Garbo takes her hands. And she goes, oh, this hair. And she puts her hands up like that. And he says, stop. That's what I want. And so she, she put her hands and she held her hair up like, like this with that moment of whatever that was that she was feeling about her hair at that moment, that's what he wanted to capture. And so he took photos of her holding her hair back. And you can still find these things online. They're actually kind of amazing. And when you see pictures today that, that, even that right there, that image, putting your hands back in your hair, how many times do you even see people do that today? But the, the point was, what he was trying to do, and he talks about this when, he, when you listen to interviews of him later on in life, when he talks about his whole philosophy in photography, he said that, that you can really can't ever capture a real portrait of a person. Because he's, when he says, when you look at a person, I mean, a person is, has this, such a wide range of things that make that person, this person who is capable of, of intense laughter is also capable of tears and crying. And he says, and there's nothing you can capture in between those things that, that gathers the essence of the person. And so he says, the only thing you can hope for is to get one moment of reality. And I've thought about that. I've, I, it's funny because I, I, I've thought about that so many times in my life that when you're taking a photo of a person, it's those moments that you capture that, that aren't the posed moments. The moments where they do something natural, where you capture that real, that real moment. And you think of all the great photos that you've seen, that's really what they are. They aren't just some portrait of somebody standing there smiling. They're the moments of reality, the moments that somehow they speak to you because they capture the essence of the human spirit. And that's, that, that, anyway, I love that, that idea. You have to get one moment of reality. That's all you can hope for because you can't really capture a complete person in, in a photograph. So you're trying to capture one moment of reality. Well, anyway, so I, this, this even gets more interesting because he, he kind of, uh, over time, I mean, you, you know, here, here th- th- this happened in the, in the 1920s, and then he continued being the photographer for Vogue and Vanity Fair, even into the 1930s, and then he kind of moves off, and he's kind of moving into retirement at this point. Well, when World War II came, th- th- he was approached and said, hey, we need you again to help take photos for during, you know, of the war. So he got, he ended up uh, out working with the Navy, kind of comes out of retirement and he goes out and he starts taking photos on a Navy ship. Well, in the process, for security reasons, they couldn't say where he was and what the ship was, but he started uh, filming, getting visuals of this particular ship that he's on and actually getting, filming the whole process. And at the end of this, he ends up creating a documentary called The Fighting Lady. That's what they called the ship because they couldn't really talk about what ship the real name was. And this film, The Fighting Lady, the only film he ever directed got an Academy Award that year as the best documentary. The only film he ever directed got an Academy Award. Well, while he was filming this, this documentary, he's also, of course, taking all these photos of, of the people on these, uh, of the, pe- the Navy, um, the sailors on this the ship and all the places that he was going with them. And he was directed all of his people. He says, don't focus on the machinery because the machinery is going to become obsolete. Get the faces of the people because people do not become obsolete. We want to capture their faces. We want to capture the sailors. We want to get the real people. And it gets back to this idea 
that he was talking about when you you can't really capture a true por- portrait of a person all you can hope for is to get one moment of reality and so what happened with this and this is why i said that it this idea and the things that would happen in these wars would end up impacting the whole world because when the war was over he had all these photos and he had uh, so many different things that really kind of showed the ugliness and brutality of war and so he had this thought what i want to do is take these things and create some exhibits that show how awful war is and maybe by putting these exhibits out it'll have an impact some even if it's just some some sort of small impact on the world and help them maybe shun war more because of how awful it is so he actually did this and he created these these exhibits that would travel around that had the, this stuff. And, and he said, the, the truth was at the end of it, there'd be people that would walk through and they'd be, you know, they'd, there'd be a lot of, wow, and that's interesting. And every once in a while, you'd see somebody shed a tear. But he said, for the most part, people would leave these exhibits and go about their life and never think about it again. And he said, I realized that the reason people weren't that it wasn't impacting people is because it was all negative. And the way he talks about it is nothing good ever comes from things that are negative. When things are presented in a negative way, nothing good ever comes of it. And he says, what I realized I needed to do was to create something positive. If I wanted to try to reduce uh, it have some impact through my art that would impact the world and reduce people's desire to fight each other. And so what he did at the age of 76, he created an exhibit called The Family of Man. And this was in 1955, The Family of Man. And he created, an, and all it was was just photos of people around the world experiencing life this exhibit i think to this day is the most visited witnessed art uh, photo exhibit ever at the time there was somewhere in the neighborhood of nine million people that went to this thing and it ended up having a massive impact on the world because again it was this positive thing that wasn't focused on the brutality of war it was focused on the fact that we are all the same that we are all part of one big family that whoever you are and wherever you live in the world you have the same happiness the same sadness the same things that you love your family your work your, your passions and that we're all the same in those ways. And, and so in some way, he actually was able to achieve through his art something that would impact the world in a positive way and helping people see each other for who they are and recognize us all as the, as the family of man. Well, I go through this because I, I wanted to share with you this really interesting thing that he wrote. And he wrote this, this article this was late, even later in his life, and it's called How Not to Be Bored by Edward Steichen. And it's very short, just a couple paragraphs, but I think you'll find this fascinating. And he starts it off with a quote that says, you can't play with the same toys all your life. And that's from Amelita Galli Curti. And here's his article. I've always believed that the moment the thing you're doing is no longer important to you, it's time to change to something entirely different. In other words, when you begin to feel stale, give yourself a swift kick in the pants before somebody else does it for you. The essential thing in anyone's life, I think, is expressed in the phrase by Lao Tzu, the way to do is to be. Many, perhaps most of us, never reach that state of aliveness where we are really conscious of ourselves. But that's precisely why we all need change. It shakes you up, gives you a new look at things, and keeps alive your sense of aliveness. 
Depending on circumstances, it can be a change of inlook and outlook to refresh your eyes, a change of reading habits, a change of social activities if you feel habit-ridden, a change of food to rekindle your tastes, a change of job if the one you have becomes stifling. Change is growth. Change is living. I am now 82 years old and still changing. I know that I am today more receptive, more keenly appreciative of life than I have ever been. All things seem fresher, seem newer to me, and more alive than ever before. We talk in this podcast every single day about this idea of change, the kinds of change in your life, the changes that are forced on you and the changes that you, that you impose on yourself. And he, he wraps that, he says that so well here. I, I, I loved this, all these, this, this entire article because it encapsulated so much of what we talk about in here. But I just want to read this one part again. When you, feel, when you begin to feel st- stale, Give yourself a swift kick in the pants before somebody else does it for you. Because so many of our changes in our life, if we don't make the change, it's going to happen anyway. And best be in front of it. But when you tie this back to the thing that he, that comment that he made about photography, get one moment of reality. Perhaps that's something that we can apply even to ourselves. When we think about how to live, how to find life, it, it, listening to his, his, his counsel here, change, it shakes you up, gives you a new look at things, keeps you alive, keeps alive your sense of aliveness. Find ways of changing. And when you look at this whole idea, get one moment of reality. Look at yourself a little bit. Who am I? What am I interested in? Am I feeling stale? Do I need a change? And maybe one way to think about it for yourself is try to find every single day for yourself the things that you're interested in, the things that are important to you. Find something new to do. Change it up a little bit. Do something different. Look at what you're doing with your life every single day. Is it something important to me? Do I love this? Am I passionate about it? What can I do to find something new? And in your own way, get that one moment of reality. Thank you for joining us on another Thick and Mystic Moment. We hope today's episode has sparked your curiosity and ignited the flames of change within you. Remember, you're not alone on this journey. Stay connected with the Thick and Mystic Moment on all major social media platforms. Please come and share your thoughts with us and share the podcast with your friends and anyone else seeking transformation in their life. This is Robert John Hadfield signing off. And remember, do something different today. Ooh,